From telegraph to talkies, information, communication, and entertainment. When Charlie Chaplin was eight, he performed in three large music halls an evening. Ten years later, in 1915, each night he could be seen in thousands of halls across the world. The remarkable transformation of spectating into a non-rival setting where Chaplin could be watched in many places simultaneously was made possible by motion pictures. They industrialized entertainment by automating it, standardizing it, and making it tradable. Bakker, 2012, page 1036. Introduction The year 1870 has been called the dawn of the age of mass communication. Everything involving information, communication, and entertainment utterly changed from 1870 to 1940. A nation bereft of information in 1870 soon benefited from the growth in newspapers as technology cheapened the price of paper and printing almost as dramatically as the Internet reduced the cost of communication in the 1990s. Soon everyone read newspapers, from the lowest working-class families to the richest tycoons. The circulation of mass-market magazines exploded, as did the circulation of books through sales and the proliferation of free public libraries. Though the telegraph was invented before 1870, its epical improvement in the speed of communication had its main effect after 1870, as information from world news to financial markets and grain prices was instantly communicated. From 1876, the telephone surpassed the telegraph by introducing instantaneous two-way communication. There was no entertainment available to the average family in 1870, except for a few traveling musicians or circus performers or in-home board or card games. The phonograph broadened the audience for professional performances, and after 1900, millions could hear a Caruso aria or a Gershwin song. But nothing in history swept across the country faster than the sensation of radio. No longer did the most humble family need to buy records to hear music. It was all free on a radio that by 1930 could be purchased for less than $20. Though radio was a sensation, it was the visual images and superstars of motion pictures that galvanized popular culture, especially in the dismal years of the 1930s, when the gleaming visions of the silver screen distracted the entire population from the grim reality of a failed economy. The quality of phonographs and radio sound reproduction improved steadily, but nothing compares to the advance of motion pictures, especially in the last 15 years of the 1870 to 1940 period covered by this chapter. A 1924 movie was silent, with intertitles and accompaniment by a piano or organ in the theater. But in a mere 15 years, Two of the greatest movies of all time appeared almost simultaneously in 1939 with full color, music, and sound, The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Those two movies' appearance in 1939, close to the 1940 borderline between parts one and two of this book, creates a symbolic bookend to the progress between 1870 and 1940. No other era in human history changed the life of ordinary citizens so rapidly in so many different dimensions, including the realm of information, communication, and entertainment. The central theme of previous chapters can be summarized in a few words, such as variety for food and clothing, networking for the arrival of the modern conveniences in the home, and revolutionary change followed by incremental improvement for the successive phases of the transportation revolution. In this chapter, the first theme is again networking, for the telephone and, later, the radio by 1940 had connected the home to the outside world. Indeed, with remarkable foresight, Alexander Graham Bell, on the very night of his first successful telephone experiment in 1876, predicted that his invention would join the network of utilities connected to each home, just like water or gas. A second theme in this chapter is multiplication, 
As the successive phases of innovation and entertainment allowed a given performance to be viewed by ever larger audiences, the curse of Baumol's disease that productivity in labor-intensive industries cannot grow because the four players in a string quartet cannot play any faster or to any larger audiences was revoked as early as the 1890s by the invention of the phonograph. Actors whose efforts had previously been limited by the size of a theater audience by 1910 were appearing before millions in silent movies. By the 1930s, Jack Benny, Rochester, Don Wilson, and their compatriots on weekly radio programs, relying only on a few jokes and sound effects, could entertain millions without the need for cameras, scenery, or props. A third theme is that the evolution of information and communication technology made business firms and workers more productive, while the development of new entertainment media raised the value of leisure time, as in the Becker framework introduced in Chapter 1. Families indicated which ways of spending their leisure time were most valuable to them by shifting from pianos and card playing in the 1890s to motion pictures after 1910 and to radio after 1920. Newspapers and magazines, a whole lot of reading going on. Literacy was advanced by 1870. Census data for that year indicate, as shown in Table 6-1, that fully 80% of the total population and 88.5% of the white population claimed to be literate. The total American literacy rate was held back by the aftermath of slavery. In 1870, only 20.1% of the black population could read. The high literacy rate of the white population, in contrast, reflected nearly universal elementary education. For the total population, Elementary school enrollment as a percentage of the population aged 5 to 13 in 1870 was 81%, implying a percentage close to 90% for the white population. The black literacy rate improved steadily after 1880 and reached 88.5% by 1940. The American white literacy rate in 1870 was substantially in excess of the 76.9% British literacy rate in the same year. What did Americans read in the last three decades of the 19th century? Throughout the long century between 1870 and the commercialization of the web browser around 1995, the reading choices were limited to books, newspapers, and periodicals. There are no available data on the numbers of copies of books sold. As John Tebble writes, the fact is that no entirely satisfactory figures were kept. Inconsistencies and confusion abound in the book publishing industry's record keeping. However, at least we can track changes in the number of books published. Roughly 2,000 books were published annually in 1880, a figure that expanded greatly to 11,300 by 1940. Much of this increase reflected the rapid growth of population. Figure 6-1 displays decade averages to compare the spread of books, newspapers, and periodicals. Each point plotted refers to the subsequent decade. So the 1880 point for books provides an average for 1880 to 89 and indicates that 0.36 books were published per 1,000 households in that decade. Book publishing per thousand households peaked in the 1910 decade at 0 .50, fell to 0 .24 in the 1940 decade, and then advanced to new highs in the 1970s and beyond. The surge in book publishing after 1950 conflicts with the widespread predictions in the early post-war years that television would mean the death knell of book reading as a leisure activity. At the turn of the century, fiction was the dominant form of book, with more than 2,200 new works of fiction published in 1901, and the romantic novel was by far the most popular form of fiction. Biography and history took second and third place. In 1901, 15 novels achieved sales of 100,000 copies or more, typically priced at $1 to $1.50 per book and these novels were also widely circulated by public libraries, of which 
There were more than 1,700 in 1900. The appetite for reading continually increased as the percentage of 14 to 17-year-olds attending high school increased from 6% in 1890 to 41% in 1928. Newspapers were already well established by the 19th century. In England, they originated at the beginning of the 17th century, and the first American newspaper was established in Boston in 1695. Unlike the British press, which was restricted by content rules imposed by the church and the government, the American press was uninhibited from the start. Also, free of the taxes that limited the ability of the British press to reduce prices, the American penny press spread rapidly in the 1820s and 1830s. In 1829, the ratio of newspapers printed per person was nine times higher in Pennsylvania than in the British Isles. The price of the newspaper was a fifth, and the price of an advertisement was a thirtieth. The low prices of American newspapers and their advertisements were made possible by the invention of the steam-powered press in 1813, and by the 1830s, presses had been developed that could print 4,000 copies per hour. Daily, Sunday, and weekly newspaper circulation increased from 7 million in 1870 to 39 million in 1900 and 96 million in 1940. Even on a per-household basis, as shown in Figure 6-1, this growth was impressive, tripling from 0 .90 in the 1870 decade to more than 3.0 between 1910 and 1930. The fact that the average household, including the lowest stratum, purchased 3.1 different newspapers is one of the most surprising in this chapter. The fastest growth occurred in 1870 to 1900, by which time newspapers had become firmly established as the main source of information and entertainment for a growing population. Color presses were introduced in the 1890s and were first used to produce color comics and supplements. By the early 20th century, newspapers had extended their content far beyond the news itself and added gossip columns, travel and leisure advice, color comics, and sporting results. The interval from 1880 to 1905 was the age of yellow journalism, likely named after the Yellow Kid comic strip character popular at the time. Metropolitan newspapers were locked in circulation wars in which success depended on publishing ever more sensational and sometimes sordid stories featuring violence, sex, catastrophe, and mayhem. The most famous circulation battle was in the late 1890s between Joseph Pulitzer's New York World and William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal. Hearst was eager to stoke the flames of conflict between Spain and the United States over Cuba and sent Frederick Remington, the photographer, who could find no signs of war. In a famous exchange of cables, Hearst responded to Remington, you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. The mass circulation national magazine was a creation of the 1880s and 1890s. Unlike newspapers for which the circulation area was limited by the need to provide time-sensitive news to a particular metropolitan area, the features contained in magazines could reach readers at a more leisurely pace. Hence, magazines were national almost from the beginning in the mid-19th century, and among those with the highest circulations late in the century were McClure's, Collier's, the Saturday Evening Post, and the Ladies' Home Journal. By the 1920s, the sedate general interest periodicals had been joined by the more scurrilous sex and confession magazines. The publishers of sex adventure magazines learned to a nicety the gentle art of arousing the reader without arousing the censor. True Story was founded in 1919 and had a circulation of almost 2 million by 1926, a record of rapid growth probably unparalleled in magazine publishing. Henry Luce invented a novel style of news and feature summaries in his new Time magazine founded in 1923, and then in 1937 launched Life, which featured stunning action photos facilitated by continuous improvements in photographic equipment and long-distance transmission.
By the 1930s, newspapers and magazines had matured into their modern form. They experienced little further change until the arrival of cable news networks in the 1980s and the fragmentation of news delivery made possible by the arrival of web browsers in the 1990s. The Telegraph Speeds Up Commerce, Transport, and Journalism Crowning many previous attempts to develop a telegraph system, dating back into the 18th century, the first patent for the electromagnetic telegraph was granted to William Cook and Charles Wheatstone in England in 1837. At about the same time, Samuel F. B. Morse had heard about experiments in Europe and by 1838 had developed his own version, complete with his own Morse code. Six more years were necessary to find a way of sending the signal over a substantial distance. The commercially viable telegraph age began on May 24th, 1844, with the famous message, What Hath God Wrought?, sent by Morse from the U.S. Capitol Building in Washington, D.C. to a railroad depot in Baltimore. Until then, the speed of travel of news had been limited to that of the foot, horse, sail, or, more recently, rail. Morse's system was the breakthrough that mattered. Within only two years, there were nine telegraph companies whose 2,000 miles of wire stretched all the way from Portland, Maine to Chicago and New Orleans. The telegraph network was ubiquitous in the East by 1855. The transcontinental telegraph debuted in late 1861, and after an abortive start in the late 1850s, a working undersea cable linking Britain and America was laid in 1866. Contemporary observers recognized the importance of the telegraph almost immediately. As early as 1847, the telegraph was seen as facilitating human intercourse and producing harmony among men and nations. In the late 1860s, a writer anticipated when the missing links shall have been completed of the great chain that will bring all civilized nations into instantaneous communication with each other, breaking down the barriers of evil prejudice and custom. At the same time, another optimistically suggested that whenever science achieves a victory, a rivet is loosened from the chains of the oppressed. Though the cost of sending a telegram was initially too high for the telegraph to gain widespread usage by private households, it was immediately viewed as essential by three industries, finance, railroads, and newspapers. The telegraph could transmit prices of commodity and financial asset data, thus reducing or eliminating the role of arbitrage for traders who had particularly good or bad access to information. By squeezing margins, news provided by telegraph began to eliminate wholesalers and middlemen who had depended on differential access to information. A domestic financial transaction could be ordered and confirmed by 1890 in less than two minutes. Before the undersea cable, the six-week delay for a round-trip crossing from New York to London could lead to inefficient purchase and sale decisions for commodities and other goods implying that the welfare benefits of the telegraph and cable included not just financial markets, but also the real sector of the economy. The telegraph became an essential tool to railroads in controlling the flow of passenger and freight trains. Perhaps the most measurable social benefit of the telegraph in the late 19th century was to allow the major railroads to operate single-track lines rather than double-track lines common in Britain. The telegraph could signal ahead of the arrival of a train, and the need to shunt a train traveling in the opposite direction onto a side spur. Alexander Field estimates a social benefit of about $1 billion as of 1890 that the telegraph contributed to freeing the railroads from the need to build double-tracked lines, an amount that translates to about 7% of 1890 nominal GDP. The telegraph and railroad working together created a single integrated market for the entire nation east of the Mississippi River by the 1870s. The nationwide marketplace used the railroads to bring goods from manufacturers to wholesalers and retailers, and the telegraph was instrumental 
in hastening the transition from an economy of small, mainly single-function firms operating in local and regional markets to large national multifunctional firms. The telegraph and the railroad together made it possible for the rapidly developing large urban department store to stock a myriad of items and manage inventory levels. For years after the transcontinental telegraph line, the mail remained important in the transmission of news. Telegraph surface was very expensive and was reserved for only brief summaries of the most important news. The mails remained the main source of communication for longer stories that were less timely and involved editorial opinion. Almost immediately after the first telegraph lines were built, the Associated Press was founded in 1846 by a group of New York newspapers that wanted to share the expense of covering the Mexican-American War and quickly grew into a nationwide association, sharing news gathered from its member newspapers and its own employees. The Associated Press and the Western Union Telegraph Company developed together as monopolies, one of information and the other of communication. In 1875, Western Union, with its network of telegraph wires and offices that reached even the smallest towns and villages, could be described as the only American corporation of truly nationwide scope. The Postal Service Comes to Every Farmer's Mailbox the early growth of the U.S. Postal Service began long before our starting date of 1870. In fact, almost a century earlier, with the appointment of Benjamin Franklin as Postmaster General by the Continental Congress in July 1775, a sharp drop in postal rates made possible by the railroad had already occurred by 1870. The rate to send a half-ounce letter more than 500 miles was 25 cents between 1792 and 1845, then dropped to 10 cents, and after 1851 to 3 cents to send a letter as far as 3,000 miles. Lesser known than most of the many revolutions in the late 19th century was that involving mail. In 1890, the population was nearly 76 million but only 19 million received mail at their door delivered by the U.S. Postal Service. For the remaining 57 million in small towns and on farms, there was no delivery. Farmers would have to hitch up their carriages and drive down rutted or muddy dirt roads to the nearest village large enough to have a post office. Then they had to wait in lines to receive their mail from the local mail clerk. Then, like an overnight miracle, rural free delivery hereafter RFD, suddenly arrived. The benefits of RFD that raised the standard of living of millions of farmers are well described. For the first time in their lives, they could have the news of the world every day except Sunday. They would know when to sell their crops to the best advantage. Important letters that sometimes meant dollars and cents to them would no longer lie two or three days in the post office because there had been no way of knowing they were there and the time they would save, a man could cultivate an extra acre of corn or haul a couple of loads of hay in the time he had formerly spent going to the post office. Implementing the RFD system took about a decade, starting in 1901. There were numerous difficulties, including the recruiting of thousands of men to ride horses to deliver the mail, not to mention the mundane task of designing the rural mailbox to be of the correct size and shape to be sanctioned by the federal government. Once it began, RFD was highly successful. The traveling rural mail carrier became the local handyman and errand boy for his patrons. Soon the automobile revolution replaced his sturdy horse with a Model T Ford as the delivery vehicle. On his route, he served as a deputy postmaster selling stamps, postcards, and envelopes, and accepting registered letters and money orders. His duties multiplied in 1913, when Parcel Post was extended to the RFD network. Throughout the 1890 to 1915 period, when RFD became universal, political pressure was generated for better roads, supporting the view that better roads made the automobile possible as much as the automobile created the demand for rural roads. Number, please. As the telephone arrives, 
like the 1879 invention of electric light discussed in Chapter 4, or the nearly simultaneous invention of the internal combustion engine summarized in Chapter 5, the invention of the telephone had been preceded by several decades of speculation and experimentation. But the gestation period for the telephone was shorter. Its 1876 invention occurred only 22 years after Philip Rice's idea, in 1854, that a flexible plate vibrating in response to air pressure changes created by the human voice could open and close an electric circuit. Further progress was limited by the inability to provide the variable pitch and tone of the human voice, rather than the simple on-off alternation created by the telegraphic switch. The turning point awaited an inventor who had a deep understanding of the processes of speech and hearing. Alexander Graham Bell was not a professional inventor. His expertise was in human speech, not electricity or mechanics. His grandfather was a Shakespearean actor who eventually founded a well-known school of elocution in London that specialized in curing stammering, and his father was a professor of elocution who developed a new method of teaching the deaf to speak. The son began his career in their footsteps in 1873 as a professor of vocal physiology at Boston University, but became distracted by his interest in trying to develop a harmonic telegraph that could transmit several messages at once on a single telegraph wire. In early 1876, Bell filed what has been called the most valuable patent application in history for a speaking telephone, only hours before a competing patent was filed by rival inventor Alicia Gray. At that time, neither had achieved a functional telephone, so these patents were speculations about future success. This dramatic event, measured in two hours, has been called the best-known instance of nearly simultaneous independent filing in the history of patenting. Bell's breakthrough came only one month after the patent application and was achieved by gradually increasing and diminishing the resistance of the circuit, in contrast to steady intermittent signals. Success was achieved in Boston on March 10, 1876, with the famous message sent between adjoining rooms as Bell spoke into the primitive transmitter while his assistant waited in the next room. Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. So sure was Bell that he had achieved a great invention that he wrote to his father that same night. I feel that I have at last struck the solution of a great problem, and the day is coming when telegraph wires will be laid onto houses, just like water or gas, and friends converse with each other without leaving home. Just as early automobiles did not work very well, the earliest telephone instruments were clumsy to use and produced indistinct sounds that were barely audible behind static. The transmitter and receiver were the same piece of equipment. One spoke into it loudly and, when finished, removed the instrument from the mouth and shifted it to the ear to hear the response. Nevertheless, Bell's device worked well enough to be introduced to the world at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in June 1876. Bell had achieved what men had long attempted, a device to send a human voice over a wire. In fact, it seems odd in retrospect that the telegraph and telephone were developed before Edison's electric light and power station. This was made possible by electric batteries, which had been introduced as early as the 1830s. Within a year, telephone service had begun in the nation's largest cities, in an environment then dominated by the telegraph, its forest of telegraph poles and wires, and its small army of uniformed boys who scurried through the streets delivering messages. A publicity circular aimed at telegraph customers noted the advantages of the telephone. One, no skilled operator is required, but direct communication may be had by speech. Two, communication is much more rapid. And three, no expense is required either for its operation, maintenance, or repair. All that was required was a leasing fee, $20 per year for home use and $40 per year for business use. There were 250,000 telephones in use by 1893 and more than 6 million by 1907. But telephones, along with electricity, 
widened the divide in living standards between rural and urban America. In between large urban areas and individual farmhouses were medium-sized towns, such as Muncie, Indiana, as extensively surveyed and described in the Lynn's Middletown. Although the first telephones appeared in Middletown in the early 1880s, it took many decades for them to reach majority status in the town's households. In 1924, Roughly half of Middletown houses had telephones. This is a strikingly slow diffusion of an invention almost 50 years later, compared to the radio in the two decades after 1920, television after 1946, or the internet after 1990. Figure 6-2 shows how the telephone dwarfed the telegraph industry almost immediately after its invention. Telegraph messages per household per year jumped from one to four between 1867 and 1878, but never exceeded eight. Already by 1880, the telephone was used for 10 conversations per household per year, a total that reached 125 in 1899 and 800 in 1929. The further growth in phone calls per household to 2,440 in recent years is explained by the fact that the ratio of telephones to households rose from 40% to 160% between 1929 and 1985. See figure 6-4. The telephone switchboard was developed almost immediately and could connect 50 to 100 lines as an operator plugged the metal tip of a cord into a jack to establish the connection. The rotary dial phone and automatic switch were invented and patented as early as 1892, but were not introduced into service by AT&T until 1919, being resisted by Bell leadership. Progress was also slow in extending the reach of the telephone across the nation. The first long-distance calls between New York and Chicago did not occur until 1892, nor the first between New York and San Francisco until 1915. That 39-year gap between the initial invention and transcontinental service was more than twice as long as the 17-year gap between the 1844 invention of the telegraph and the 1861 completion of the transcontinental telegraph. The varying growth rate of subscribers is evident in Figure 6-4 later this chapter. Growth accelerated between 1893 and 1908 after the expiration of the original Bell patents with the emergence of independent companies. In the 15 years after 1894, price competition pushed the annual rates for Bell residential service down by two-thirds. By 1907, the independent companies accounted for almost half the telephones in the United States. But five years later, the Bell companies controlled 85% of the telephones either directly or through sub-license agreements. At this point, AT&T had effectively subdued competition in the rest of the country. As the Bell companies bought up their competition, prices stopped declining, and the growth of subscribers visibly slowed between 1920 and 1929, followed by the cessation of growth during the Depression decade of the 1930s. The telephone was essential for business before it became a part of everyday American life for households. Among the first adopters of the telephone were police departments. Telephone boxes connected to fire stations were common by the 1880s. The distinction between initial business use of the telephone and the delayed adoption for personal use was blurred as customers asked to use the telephones of local merchants for personal calls. A Chicago druggist reported in 1888 about a young lady who called to inform her fiancé that she no longer intended to marry him. The great expansion of telephone service to the household brought multidimensional benefits that have never entered the GDP statistics. The telephone saved lives by allowing those suffering from illness or injury to summon help. It joined with the invention of the electric elevator in making multi-story high-rise office and apartment buildings possible. It made living alone possible and contributed to the breakup of multi-generational households. A mixed blessing, as was also brought by the telephone's role in diminishing, if not extinguishing, the ancient art of letter writing.
The central role of the telephone operator in the early decades led to previously unanticipated uses for the telephone. The operator many times gets the request, please ring my bell at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. 5,000 times every day in Chicago, she is asked the time of day. Election and prize fight results. Football and baseball scores are asked for and repeated. Likewise, the rural operator became an information center for the local community, helping locate missing children and providing warning of floods and fires. In rural areas, most phones were on the party line, in which two, four, or more households shared the same line, just as would be true today for multiple extension telephones within the same home. When the instrument was picked up on a party line, one often heard an ongoing conversation. In those days before radio soap operas, listening to neighbors talk on the party line became a standard form of rural entertainment. One major limitation of the 1940 phone network was the price of long-distance phone calls. Figure 6-3 shows telephone rates for three-minute calls between New York, London, and San Francisco. Though rates had dropped significantly by 1940, a three-minute call to San Francisco from New York was $46 in $2,005, and the same call to London was a lofty $242. Rates remained persistently high into the later 20th century. A three-minute call to San Francisco did not drop below $10 until 1966, and the London rate finally fell below $10 in 1981. Such prices kept the usefulness of the phone network primarily on the local level. The telephone was a uniquely American innovation. Not only was it invented in the United States, albeit by a transplanted Scotsman, but also its spread and usage far exceeded that in other countries. The number of telephones per person in 1900 was four times more than in England, six times more than in Germany, and 20 times more than in France. There were as many telephones in New York State as in all Europe. The main reason why the Bell Monopoly was tolerated by the U.S. government antitrust authorities was that telephone usage was far ahead of other countries. Foreign telephone companies were also monopolies, but were owned by the government, and they typically set such low rates that there were insufficient funds to build the network and, often, long waiting lists for telephone service. The government-imposed breakup of the Bell system would wait another half-century until 1983. The phonograph, the first step in curing Baumol's disease. Baumol's cost disease was originally proposed using the example of a Mozart string quartet. Any performance of the quartet would always require four players, thus precluding any productivity gains. But in the economy as a whole, productivity increases, and wage rates increase roughly at the same rate. Thus, to prevent chamber music players from defecting into other lines of work, paying higher wages, their wages must increase as well, thus requiring price increases for classical music concerts. This cost disease afflicts not just classical music, but also education, health care, and any industry in which productivity gains are limited right down to the lowly neighborhood barbershop. Even though Baumol was writing in 1967, the constraints imposed by his disease were already loosened as long ago as July 1877, when Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. In few other inventions was there a longer time gap between the low quality of the product and the initial attempt to convert music and speech into a reproducible form and the ultimately superb quality of the product. Consider the contrast between Edison's initial piece of tinfoil and today's music reproduction on digital audio players. Though the telephone was in commercial use within a year of its initial invention, Edison's 1877 discovery, in which he recited and then repeated, Mary has a little lamb, was not ready for prime time. The tinfoil recording medium was flimsy. Even though Edison laid claim to the invention, in part by transporting it in 1878 to a demonstration for then-President Rutherford Hayes, the design and production of a mass consumer product eluded him.
Edison did not originally intend the photograph to be used for entertainment, and rather viewed it as a business device, an early ancestor of the dictaphone. He referred to it as the talking machine. An early New York Times editorial treated the main usefulness of the recording machine as a device to store forever, the speeches of current politicians. Edison himself was better at prophesying than at mechanical perfection. In an 1878 article, he predicted that phonographs would allow books to be read to the blind, to teach children to speak correctly, to create singing dolls, to transfer a musical performance from one moment in time to another, and the preservation of the voices of previous generations of family members. Edison's imagination soared in predicting that the phonographic clock will tell you the hour of the day, call you to lunch, send your lover home at ten. Even though Edison soon began to record on wax cylinders, these turned out to be too soft and fragile and were difficult to manufacture and ship in large quantities. By 1884, critics wrote that the failure of the phonograph did much to destroy the popularity of Mr. Edison. Edison was furious that a competing technology called the graphophone, backed in part by his rival Bell, was produced by, quote, pirates attempting to steal my invention, end quote. Only in 1888 did Edison introduce his perfected phonograph. But it was far from perfect, as mechanical parts were prone to malfunction, and the internal battery was unreliable. The early phonographs relied not on electricity, but rather on a crank or foot treadle. Both Edison's phonograph and the competing graphophone technology were soon eclipsed by Emil Berliner, who perfected by 1888 a better method based on a flat disc, which initially revolved at about 70 RPM. Berliner invented the main technical feature of recorded discs, in which the groove in the disc both records laterally and propels the stylus. The word record was in common use by the 1890s. Berliner's invention eventually was sold and became the Victor Talking Machine Company, which eventually merged in 1929 with RCA to become RCA Victor, the world's largest recording company. Its famous trademark, the dog Nipper listening to a gramophone, was borrowed by Berliner from a French painting and was promptly registered as a trademark in 1900 as his master's voice, and later the abbreviation, HMV. The machines made by the Victor Talking Machine Company were advertised as Victrolas, and this name came to be used generically to refer to any type of record player, particularly the floor models that were enclosed in hardwood casing carved to match other pieces of furniture. The first phonographs appeared in the 1890s, not in homes, but as coin slot machines in soda fountains and saloons. For a nickel, patrons could hear renditions of military marches by John Philip Sousa or folk ballads written by Stephen Foster. The growth in home ownership of phonographs after 1900 helped promote new types of music, including the dance craze of 1910 to 15, when record companies advertised their authentic dance tempo records in popular magazines such as the Saturday Evening Post. Though the phonograph for the first time brought professionally performed music into the home, so did the player piano, which was invented at about the same time, and which became widely sold around the turn of the century. From today's perspective, we might have expected the newly born player piano industry to have been eclipsed by phonographs that could reproduce the voices of singers and many musical instruments, not just the piano. But the player piano in 1900 to 1905 competed not with today's fidelity of sound reproduction, but rather with the primitive phonographs of that era, with their spring-loaded cranks, poor acoustical reproduction, and breakable shellac records. The piano for decades had been a central component of cultural capital in which young women were expected to take piano lessons and become proficient. Phonographs allowed ordinary people for the first time to hear music properly performed by professionals. At a moment's notice, music could be produced that went far beyond piano playing, including bands, orchestra, and both popular and classical voices. Enrico Caruso, 
who made 490 commercially released recordings between 1902 and 1920, became one of the best-known personalities of his era. Whatever the flaws of the early phonographs, the initial encounter of an ordinary person with a recording device represented a moving experience that utterly changed the availability of music and voices. The initial pace of introduction of the phonograph into the American home was limited by competition with the piano, and expenditures for rewards were an alternative use of limited family budgets that could otherwise purchase sheet music and piano lessons. The phonograph did not create instant obsolescence for the piano, and indeed the census of manufacturers shows that more pianos than phonographs were produced in 1899, 1904, and 1909. The piano was a major expenditure. Consider these prices in the context of a nominal average personal disposable income per household in 1910 of $1,240. Whereas the 1902 Sears Roebuck catalog lists home organs for as little as $27, the single piano shown, an upright with a carved mahogany and walnut cabinet, cost $98 plus delivery, and its 800-pound weight imposed substantial additional freight charges. The same 1902 Sears catalog devoted four pages to a wide variety of phonographs, ranging in price from $20 to $120. Two disc-based models were offered at $20 and $40. A selection of pros from the catalog tells us much, not just about the disc player, but also about the art of catalog writing in 1902, revealing only at the end that this phonograph was propelled not by electricity, but by winding up a spring-loaded motor. It is the most beautiful instrument, massive in proportion and handsome in appearance. The mechanism is contained in a handsomely designed, quarter-sawed, highly polished oak cabinet. The mechanism of the machine is well-nigh perfect, assuring spring and reliable action, and running three of the large 10-inch concert records with each winding. Not only was the power for early phonographs based on winding and springs, but the recording itself was acoustic, collected by the phonograph's horn rather than by an electrical microphone. A singer had to stand close and put his or her face into the horn, and only some instruments in an orchestra could be heard at all. It was not until 1925 that the technology of microphones and vacuum tubes had progressed far enough to achieve accurate music reproduction on records. Until 1948, all records were recorded live, from beginning to end, with no editing. Any flaw or error either would be present on the recording, or would require another performance to eliminate the flaw. A series of innovations in the mid-1920s made previous phonographs obsolete. The wind-up spring drive was replaced by an electric motor. The sound for the records themselves began to be created using a microphone and vacuum tubes rather than acoustic horn, and record changers were introduced that allowed an entire symphony to be heard without the need manually to change records every three minutes. By the late 1920s, the floor-standing cabinet phonograph had been made obsolete and was replaced by a radio-slash-phonograph combination unit that used the radio's amplifier to produce the sound from the phonograph, thus replacing the acoustical horn not just for recording, but also for listening. How rapidly did household use of the phonograph grow in comparison with the telephone and the radio? Figure 6-4 compares the number of phonographs per household with the number of residential telephones per household. The race between the telephone and phonograph was surprisingly close. Note that fully 50 years elapsed between the nearly simultaneous invention of the telephone and phonograph and the date when they were present in half of American homes. Figure 6-4 also contrasts the very different pattern of telephone and radio use in the 1930s, when the percentage of households that had telephones declined from 45% in 1929 to 33% in 1933. Because telephones were rented rather than bought outright, phones simply disappeared from homes in which the Depression had slashed incomes so much that the telephone bill could not be paid.
In contrast, radios were purchased, and radio ownership soared throughout the 1930s, from 35% in 1929 to 82% in 1940. When Franklin Roosevelt gave his Day of Infamy speech, the day after the Pearl Harbor attack, almost the entire nation was equipped to listen to him in their own homes. In contrast, telephone usage in the household did not exceed 50% until 1953. Electricity, motor vehicles, public transit, and public sanitation infrastructure changed American life, particularly in cities. Virtually overnight between 1890 and 1929, the telephone and the phonograph were part of this epical set of changes. Telephone lines linked at least half of total households, and most of those in urban areas, adding further connections to the networked house already hooked up to the outside world with electric, gas, water, and sewer lines. The telephone allowed people to talk to each other without leaving the house and phonographs replaced amateur music with professionally performed music, displaced performances across months or years of time, and represented the first of many inventions that cured Baumol's disease. Radio brings the world into almost every home. Radio spread across the nation like wildfire, so rapidly that more than 80% of American homes had at least one radio within 20 years of the launch of the first commercial radio station in 1920. The speed of radio's arrival exceeded that of electricity, the motor vehicle, the telephone, or the phonograph, and it is easy to see why. Unlike the acoustic phonograph, the radio arrived as a fully electric device, and indeed with its vacuum tubes, constituted the first phase of the electronics revolution that dominated the post-war years. After the radio was purchased, all the entertainment it provided was free, with no need to buy records or player piano rolls, and its ability to provide instantaneous news reports put it into competition with the daily newspaper. Transmission of messages through the air rather than via wire long antedated the introduction of commercial radio. As with most of the great inventions of the late 19th century associated with particular names such as Edison or Bell, the discoveries of lesser-known predecessors extend back decades earlier. Although in 1896, Guglielmo Morconi obtained the first patent for wireless telegraphy, more than three decades earlier, in 1864, James Clark Maxwell first presented his theory of electromagnetic waves. The earliest experiments that transmitted and received waves were carried out in London by David Edward Hughes in December 1879, the same month when Carl Benz developed the first workable internal combustion engine, and two months after Edison's first electric light. A newspaper article in 1899 summed up Hughes's unappreciated role. The 1879 experiments were virtually a discovery of Hertzian waves before Hertz, of the coherer before Branley, and of wireless telegraphy before Marconi and others. What Marconi achieved was to become the first person to send wireless signals over significant distances. Though numerous other inventors had come close to his particular combination of components, originally invented by others, he was the entrepreneur who put the ingredients together and at age 22 filed the first patents in 1896 in both the United Kingdom and the United States. His first public 1896 demonstration sent a clear signal over almost two miles in the United Kingdom and by 1901 he had sent a signal across the Atlantic. Almost immediately, the British Navy adopted wireless telegraphy, and the role of wireless in the 1912 Titanic disaster, when several nearby ships did not have their receivers turned on, has become an iconic part of popular culture. The implementation of commercial radio required a whole series of additional inventions between 1900 and 1920 to transmit voice and music instead of just Morse code. Among these was the 1907 vacuum tube, which was central to electronics until the transistor emerged after 1947. 
Though the generators, antennas, amplifiers, and receivers were ready to create commercial radio as early as 1913, World War I intervened and required a postponement. By election night of 1920, the planets were aligned, the technology was in place, and the world's first commercial radio station went on the air. Not in London, not in New York, but in Pittsburgh. The electrical magnet, George Westinghouse, whose AC current had triumphed over Edison's DC, saw great potential for his company to sell radio sets. But currently, there was nothing for them to listen to, except for sporadic and unpredictable speech and music transmitted by ham radio operators on unknown frequencies. Westinghouse worked with a local ham operator, Frank Conrad, and built a small shack on the roof of a Westinghouse building. At precisely 6 p.m. on election night, November 2nd, 1920, KDKA's announcer Leo Rosenberg spoke the first words ever heard on commercial radio and humbly asked at the end, in effect, is anyone listening out there? This is KDKA of the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We shall now broadcast the election returns. We are receiving these returns through the cooperation and by special arrangement with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun. We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us, as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching and how it is being received. Immediately after the KDKA inaugural evening, interest in radio exploded throughout the nation. At night, KDKA could be heard throughout the eastern states. In 1921, the station went from one first to another as it broadcast the first presidential inaugural address, the first sporting event, the first play-by-play -play baseball broadcast, and the first football game broadcast. Initially, the audiences for these broadcasts were small because it took time for manufacturing plants and distribution networks to be set up to sell receivers widely. Then, in the winter of 1921-22, the commercial potential of radio arrived. As the floodgates were opened, the word radio quickly replaced wireless telephony. A San Francisco newspaper described the simultaneous discovery by millions of Americans that there is radio music in the air every night, everywhere. Anybody can hear it at home on a receiving set, which any boy can put up in an hour. By the end of 1923, there were 556 radio stations, and sales of radio receivers soared from $60 million in 1922 to $843 million in 1929. We have already examined the diffusion of the telephone and phonograph in figure 6-4. Also shown in the same chart is that 46% of American families had radios by 1930 and fully 80% by 1940. No single event in the history of invention before 1940 brought about a more striking egalitarianism of a particular product, news and entertainment that could be enjoyed equally by the richest baron or poorest street cleaner. The stunning impact of radio was summarized in late 1922, before most families had receivers, in this contrast between listening to the radio and being in a theater. Now we are assembled again in KDKA's unlimited theater, where rear seats are hundreds of miles from the stage, and where the audience, all occupying private boxes, can come late or leave early without embarrassing the speaker or annoying the rest of the audience. It could be argued that the radio defined the first half of the 20th century as much as the automobile did. Though the phonograph had brought professionally performed music into the home, now the whole package of news, music, information, and advertising was available every day and evening. The first modern mass medium, radio made America into a land of listeners, entertaining and educating, angering and delighting, and joining every age and class into a common culture. Everything provided by the radio was free after the receiving set had been purchased. In 1927, Sears sold tabletop radios for as little as $24.95 and offered them on the installment plan at $4 down and $4 per month. $25 was less than 
of a typical working class household income in the 1920s. Just as floor model phonographs had become available two decades earlier, housed in elaborately carved wooden cabinets, cabinet radios were listed in the 1927 Sears catalog at prices ranging from $50 to $100. Among the broader effects of radio was the transformation of immediacy and intimacy. Listeners could hear events as they occurred, including the vocal reaction of the Parisian crowds to Lindbergh's 1927 flight, without waiting for a dry newspaper account the next day. Immediacy was joined by intimacy. Both described the effects of Roosevelt's galvanizing first fireside chat of March 12, 1933, when he spoke to each listener, as if he or she were there at FDR's side, starting with the explanation that the banking system relies on confidence and assuring the nation that it would be safe to place deposits in the banks when they reopened in the following week. Even before the first commercial radio broadcast in 1920, General Electric, GE, had established the Radio Corporation of America. RCA became the symbol of the new radio era, and its stock was referred to simply as radio. The spectacular rise and fall of its stock became an icon of the 1920s stock market boom and bust. Its stock price rose by a factor of 100 between 1924 and the 1929 peak, and then lost almost all its value by 1931. As early as 1922, the need was seen for linking together radio stations so that they could share the same programming. Network radio, as we know it, arrived in 1926 with the formation of the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, as an enterprise jointly owned by RCA, GE, and Westinghouse. Before the formation of NBC, there had been two groups of stations, one centered around New York's WEAF, now WNBC, and the other around WJZ, now WABC. These became two separate networks known as NBC Red and NBC Blue, which later, in 1943, became ABC. By the time of Lindbergh's flight in June 1927, the NBC Red network had linked together with telephone lines 50 stations in 24 states. The spreading influence of the networks was intertwined with the development of the large clear channel stations, each of which was the only station on its frequency, and each of which could be heard for long distances at night. By the early 1930s, almost all evening programming came from the networks, so rural listeners in Iowa would hear the same programming whether they turned in to WCCO in Minneapolis or KMOX in St. Louis. For the 47% of Americans who in 1925 lived on farms and in small rural towns, the radio was a blessing. When they say radio, they don't mean a cabinet, an electrical phenomenon, or a man in the studio. They refer to a pervading and somewhat godlike presence which has come into their lives and homes. Rural areas differed from urban America by adopting the motor vehicle and the telephone in larger percentages than electricity and radio by 1929. But during the 1930s, that changed as radio sets declined in price. Electricity had not yet arrived in rural America because of the high cost of building the distribution network. Nevertheless, the rural use of radios became almost universal in the 1930s thanks in part to the development of efficient battery-powered sets. The central role of radio during the 1930s is supported by a survey that Americans would rather sell their refrigerators, bathtubs, telephones, and beds to make rent payments than to part with the radio box that connected to the world. As radio shifted toward a financial system based on advertising commercials, so programming shifted away from educational features and classical music to popular music and comedy-slash-variety shows, often starring those who had been displaced from vaudeville. At its peak in 1933, the daily Amos and Andy show earned its two black-faced comedic stars an annual income of $100,000, higher than that of the presidents of NBC, RCA, or the United States.
The commercials that financed this extravagance were for widely distributed packaged goods that were consumed across the entire nation, including cigarettes, toothpaste, coffee, and laxatives. Comedian George Burns recalls the Amos and Andy show in his autobiographical memories of the effect of radio on his previous career as a vaudeville comedian. Then radio came in. For the first time, people didn't have to leave their homes to be entertained. The performers came into their house. I knew that vaudeville was finished when theaters began advertising that their shows would be halted for 15 minutes so that the audience could listen to Amos and Andy. It's impossible to explain the impact that radio had on the world to anyone who didn't live through that time. In part, the growing popularity of radio reflected the continuing decline in the prices of receivers and improvements in their quality, a familiar theme from the post-war electronic age. But an equally important stimulus to receiver sales was the increased quality and variety of programming. Cabinet radios became the central piece of furniture in American households and served to join parents and children alike together to listen to comedy and variety shows, the latest news, drama, and even the newly developed soap operas. The radio offered the compensations of fantasy to lonely people with deadening jobs or loveless lives, to people who were deprived or emotionally starved. The commercialization of radio in the 1930s was intertwined with the pervasiveness of its advertising. Unlike a magazine in which a page could be flipped, radio advertisements could not be escaped, particularly because most people sat around a console radio and would have to get up from their chairs to turn down the volume. Advertising was, indirectly, the reason why the radio invaded the American household so much more quickly than did the phonograph or telephone. For advertising allowed the content to be free. Listeners in the 1930s were rarely reminded that the Great Depression was occurring. Dance bands played happy music, and Jack Benny would have worried about money in the best of times. In this apparent paradox, perhaps, lay radio's ultimate appeal. Real life in the 1930s was hard enough to bear. When people clicked their radios on, they were seeking not reality, but escape. Radio brought relief with a message from our sponsor. The establishment in 1934 of the Federal Communications Commission threatened broadcasters with a new era of regulation to force them to broadcast more cultural and public service programming instead of so much light comedy and music financed by the sponsorship of commercial advertising. Responding before any significant regulation occurred, Sarnoff hired Arturo Toscanini to create an entire orchestra and conduct it, and the NBC Symphony was given its own separate studio in the RCA building, now known as 30 Rock. Starting on Christmas night, 1937, the NBC orchestra continued until 1954. The public service component of broadcasting turned in the late 1930s to the threat of war. An epical moment in the history of news broadcasting occurred on the night of the Anschluss, the German takeover of Austria, on March 13, 1938. On that night was born CBS World News Tonight, which still broadcasts nightly even today, and which then achieved the first transatlantic shortwave radio link between Robert Trout in New York and correspondents from London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, and Washington. Notably, the broadcast featured the network broadcasting debut of Edward R. Murrow, reporting that evening from Vienna in a colloquial and informal style notably different than the other contributors. In the gloomy Depression years, the downtrodden masses looked to sources of inspiration to the Horatio Algiers who, by effort and luck, could lift themselves from poverty to success. By 1937, all of these new social and technological forces were converging. The new machine of fame stood waiting. All it needed was the subject itself. And that subject turned out to be a horse named Seabiscuit. The rise of this small, crooked-legged horse from obscurity fascinated the nation. And Seabiscuit has been called, at least by the standard of popular interest, 
the biggest single news event of 1938. The match race between Seabiscuit and War Admiral in June 1938 has been called not only the greatest match race of all time, but also the most listened to radio broadcast in history up to that time. With 40 million listeners and a population of 129 million, FDR was so absorbed in the broadcast that he kept a room full of advisors waiting. He would not emerge until the race was over. Fewer than 60 years separated the earliest wireless experiments from the mature radio industry of 1938. In 1879, David Edward Hughes succeeded in sending a wireless signal over a distance of a few hundred meters in London. And by 1938, network radio had gained the ability to connect correspondents on different continents in live and instantaneous communication, as in the inaugural CBS World News Tonight broadcast. And the enormous audience for the Seabiscuit race demonstrated radio's ability to focus the nation's attention on a single event. Only three years later, an even larger audience would listen to FDR's condemnation of the Day of Infamy as the United States declared war on Japan. The Motion Picture from the Nickelodeon to Gone with the Wind The history of the motion picture began with the still photo, going back to Aristotle's first observations about the laws of optics around 330 BC and to the invention of the pinhole camera camera obscura, by an Arab around A.D. 1000. Until the 1820s, however, there was no way to preserve the images that emerged from the pinhole. The daguerreotype, invented in 1839 by Louis Daguerre, was the first process that allowed a permanent image to be created, and soon afterward, in 1841, the Englishman Henry Fox Talbot developed a method for making a negative from which multiple positive prints could be made. However, these early processes were clumsy and relied on wet plate negatives that had to be developed quickly after the photograph was taken, in practice requiring the photographer to carry a darkroom along with him. Only in 1879 was the dry plate negative invented, making possible handheld cameras. And finally, in 1889, George Eastman invented film, and with it, the modern era of photography. The initial development of motion pictures focused on the creation of motion and the achievement of a projected image on a wall. Already Edison had been left behind in the development of the phonograph by clinging to the cylinder instead of adopting the flat record disc. In the same way, he failed in the early 1890s to create a motion picture product that was more than a novelty. His kinetoscope of 1894, which was a cabinet into which the viewer squinted to see a small moving image, suffered from its inherent limitations. The image was very small, and the film loop had a viewing duration of only 20 seconds, though it was soon extended to 90 seconds. Edison failed to see the commercial potential of motion pictures as anything other than a tool of education. In the end, the problem of passing sufficient light through the film to illuminate a large screen was solved by Thomas Armat, who devised a projector in which bright pictures and smooth action were achieved by stopping each frame as it passed by the projection lamp. Because Armat did not have sufficient funds or reputation to commercialize his project, he reached an agreement to share the profits with Edison for the newly christened Vitascope. Its debut in 1896 included Uncle Sam knocking a diminutive bully, John Bull, to his knees, street scenes from New York, and the first medium-range close-up of a kiss. The audience fairly shrieked and howled approval. Thus, thanks to his wealth and fame, Edison received credit for the motion picture, even though he played virtually no part in its invention. Still photographs were originally viewed through home instruments called stereoscopes and in public penny arcades, which also provided access to phonographs, fortune-telling machines, and sometimes slot machines. As with vaudeville, penny arcades were not available in rural areas and tended to flourish in dense urban neighborhoods, where families could participate for a few pennies without having to spend scarce cash on public transportation. Around 1905, 
Penny arcades began to create separate sections in the back for the projection of motion pictures on a wall or screen, because admission to the motion picture cost five cents rather than a penny. Such operations quickly became known as Nickelodeons. Soon, Nickelodeons emerged from the back room of the Penny Arcade and became separate buildings. By 1908, there were more than 200 Nickelodeons in Manhattan alone, and at least 8,000 nationwide, attracting 4 million customers per day. The standard design was 20 feet wide and 80 feet long, with wooden chairs or benches for seating. A basic technological limitation was the projection mechanism that halted the film at each frame. These stops and starts made the screen pulse with an eye-straining flicker effect, which led to the new expression, going to the flicks. At the front, behind a railing, was the enclave of the piano player who accompanied the silent features. Though the interiors might be plain, Increasingly, the exteriors featured giant arches and extensive decoration in themes ranging from Moorish to Gothic to Beaux-Arts, often decorated with dragons, faces, or statuary. Every theater was studded with light bulbs, leading to the description of each city's theater district as the Great White Way. From our perspective, it is hard to imagine the excitement that these early film shows evoked but many of the viewers had never traveled or had a chance to see places more than a few miles from their homes. For the first time, a person might see what a moving elephant looked like or gain a first view of a beach on the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans. In one early Nickelodeon feature, when a train pulling into a station came straight toward the camera, several customers in the front rows panicked and ran out. The transition from Nickelodeons to movie palaces began as early as 1911 with the opening of Detroit's Columbia Theater, which was equipped not only with 1,000 seats, but also with the first movie pipe organ. The few years before America's 1917 entry into World War I were the most frenetic period of theater building, as the small and simple Nickelodeons were replaced by mammoth theaters in the center of every city, and similar but smaller theaters in the residential neighborhoods. The ornate decoration of the palaces included, quote, carved niches, the cloistered arcades, the depthless mirrors, and the great sweeping staircases. Watch the eyes of the child as it enters the portals of our great theaters and treads the pathway into fairyland, end quote. The exotic architecture included themes inspired by Babylon, Grenada, and the Riviera. The new movie palaces provided a social leveling, as the working-class customers, for a mere seven cents, were able to enter palaces that would have inspired upper-class barons and lords. They offered a gilded mansion for the weekly invasion of those who lived in stuffy apartments, or a gorgeous canopy to spread over a cramped and limited life. In October 1921, a Chicago Tribune report on a theater opening gushed that, for sheer splendor, expensiveness, and display, the Chicago theater sets a world record. The decade of 1910 to 1920 witnessed a complete transition from very short features in Nickelodeons to full-length features in large theaters. Despite its crude racism and glorification of the Ku Klux Klan, D.W. Griffin's The Birth of a Nation pioneered many movie techniques, including close-ups, rapid editing, and fade-outs. The swift rise of weekly moviegoing brought with it the star system. And by 1915, Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford were familiar names, and their fame from film appearances was magnified by newspaper and periodical profiles. By 1922, nationwide weekly movie attendance had reached 40 million per week, or roughly 36% of the population. This implies that the entire population, from babies to elderly grandmothers, were going to the movies more than once every three weeks. This number is particularly impressive considering that the nation, in 1920, was still half rural. Thus, the frequency of moviegoing must have been close to once per week in urban America. A 1919 study of Toledo, Ohio, tallied a weekly attendance of 316,000 in a population of 243,000. 
movie attendance per person had reached 130%. The Toledo study provides valuable insight into the motion picture industry in 1919. The prices of movie attendance ranged from 7 to 55 cents, with an average of 15 cents. Another source suggests that in 1913 movie tickets averaged a mere 7 cents. The average movie show lasted roughly 2.3 hours and consisted of news review, treatise of titles from magazines, an educational reel, clown comedy, and finally the feature film. News reels were common during the silent film era, and the first all-news theater opened in New York City in 1909. Audiences who had previously learned of the news from dry newspaper accounts were now captivated by their vivid new view of real events. In Toledo and across the nation, the largest theaters had live organ performances to accompany the feature film. The studios distributed cue sheets of suggested music, but the organist or pianist had full license to improvise. So the birth of a nation could sound quite different in Toledo from how it sounded in, say, Seattle. In a 1922 essay, an organist cited examples of the pieces of classical music that were ready to accompany any scene. For instance, a movie scene with rapidly rushing water could be accompanied by Prelude to the Deluge by Saint-Saëns. Organists and pianists played their accompaniment over and over for multiple daily performances, so their performances could sound improvised, but were the result of intensive homework. A surprising aspect of film history is that the industry became so large even before the talking picture was invented. Another surprise is that the marriage of motion pictures with sound took so long, considering that sound motion pictures had been a goal of Edison's as early as 1890. The problems bedeviled inventors through the 1920s, including the core problem of achieving synchronization of voice and picture, and the awkward fact that sound amplification in 1925 was unable to match the space dimensions of a modern motion picture theater. The American Lee de Forest invented the technique of sound on film in which the soundtrack is photographically recorded on the side of the strip of motion picture film with the sound physically adjacent to the picture on the film strip. Perfect synchronization is automatic. Though sound-enhanced newsreels of Lindbergh's flight had been shown in theaters as early as May 1927, a few more months were required for the sensational premiere of the first talkie, Al Jolson and the Jazz Singer. The large profits made by Warner Brothers from the first talkie, followed by three more in 1928, convinced the other studio owners that they needed to convert immediately to sound. The conversion occurred almost overnight, and by 1930, movie advertisements carried the reassuring logo, 100% talking. The transition from silent to sound movies occurred very fast and created obsolescence not just in mechanical equipment and jobs for pianists and organists, but in the previous stars. As famously satirized in the 1952 movie Singing in the Rain, some stars of the silent era had screechy and unattractive voices and were passed over for a new generation of movie stars. As shown in Figure 6-5, during 1929-33, the worst years of the economy's collapse, weekly movie attendance per person declined from 73% to 48%. But then, there was a rapid recovery to 68% in 1936 to 37, and the ratio remained above 60% consistently from 1935 to 1948 before plummeting to 10% in the 1960s and thereafter, as television became the main form of entertainment. The continued popularity of movies through the late 1940s reflected a different business model than radio whose provided content was free after the receiver was purchased. A movie show could be purchased without any initial investment, and first-run movies at downtown palaces fell in price during 1929-33 to from 50 cents to 25 cents, and second runs in neighborhood theaters from a quarter to a dime. At 25 cents per admission, a person could attend 50 annual movie shows for $12.50, 
or 2.4% of 1936 nominal disposable personal income per capita of $525. Audiences in the 1930s came to expect their admission to purchase a double feature, and the array of choices was endless, from gangster films, westerns, and screwball comedies to musical epics with choreography by Busby Berkeley or the light-footed dancing of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Fantasy, horror, and science fiction rounded out the list, with Dracula, Frankenstein, and King Kong evoking screams from millions of moviegoers. Four of the top ten movies of the 20th century, as ranked by the American Film Institute in 1998, were made in the four years between 1939 and 1942. Two of these, Citizen Kane, 1941, and Casablanca, 1942, lie slightly after the 1940 dividing line between parts one and two of this book. But the other two provide a demonstration as clear as day and night of the progress of the sound motion picture over the decades since The Jazz Singer. The Wizard of Oz, with its unprecedented mix of sepia-toned monochrome in the early sequences, followed by vivid color afterward, not only enchanted movie viewers in 1939, but became even more familiar to post-war audiences, thanks to its annual rebroadcast on CBS television starting in 1956. The movie made Judy Garland a star and earned two Academy Awards for the classic score by Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg. How the nation must have gasped with wonder and delight when Dorothy emerged intact after the monochrome tornado, which had dumped her house on top of the Wicked Witch of the East and wandered out into the technicolor paradise of Oz, turning to her canine friend with the line that would echo through the rest of the century. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Even though The Wizard of Oz is as familiar to us today, thanks to its post-war TV rebroadcasts, as is Gone with the Wind, the latter film was a much greater sensation for Americans in 1939. Margaret Mitchell's epic novel had been a bestseller in 1936, and the nation's attention was riveted for two years in the search for the actress to play Scarlett O'Hara. Fan magazines breathlessly reported on anything even remotely associated with the project, and MGM went so far as to replicate the portico of Tara, Scarlett's family home, for a gala opening night. All the hoopla paid off. Gone with the Wind was an immediate enduring hit. It wraps up the 1930s in grand style. For sheer entertainment, the real reason people attend the movies, it stands as the champion of the decade. Conclusion From Prehistory to the Modern Era in 70 Years If we view this book as setting out a contest between improvements in the standard of living before and after 1940, then surely this chapter would provide the weakest evidence of advance before 1940 compared to the other chapters in Part 1. What could compete with the revolutions in Chapter 3 for food production, variety, and distribution, and the shift from homemade to store-bought apparel? Or in Chapter 4, the emergence over 1870 to 1940 in the networked home, with its connections to electricity, gas, water, and sewer, together with the development of enclosed furnaces, stoves, and all the other consumer appliances. Or in Chapter 5, the evolution from primitive horse-drawn omnibuses to the rapid transit of elevated trains and subways, as well as the epical shift from the urban pollution of horses to much faster, more efficient, and cleaner motor vehicles. Compared to such fundamental progress, it might seem that this chapter's topic of information, communication, and entertainment might pale into insignificance compared to post-war developments. After all, so much that we take for granted today was missing in 1940, when even the most primitive early nine-inch black-and-white television sets were still in the future, not to mention color television and later cable television with its hundreds of channels. Music played on long-playing discs, tapes, compact discs, and digital audio players, and information gathered on the Internet and viewed on ever smaller and more convenient desktops, laptops, smartphones, and tablets. Yet one can argue that the effect on American culture and society of the progress before 1940 
made more difference than that which has occurred since 1940. During the 1870 to 1940 interval, isolation was replaced by communication. So many aspects of human existence that did not exist in 1870 became possible, from phoning a neighbor to borrow a cup of sugar, to an anguish plea by a farmer to request emergency assistance, to the availability on phonograph records of the world's classical and popular music, to the radio revolution that made news and entertainment live, immediate, and free, and finally, to the motion picture with its extraordinary emergence as the dominant form of entertainment. As we lament the passing of print media today in the face of internet competition, it is easy to lose sight of how dominant the print media were after 1870 but not before. The readership of books, magazines, and newspapers exploded after 1870. This supports the theme in this book that economic growth, though simmering in the wings before 1870, came on stage and became the driving fact in human existence in the century after 1870. It was not just the effect of technology in creating rapid reductions in the price of paper and printing technology, but also the contribution of almost universal literacy, except for the former slaves in the South. And this quantum leap in the amount of reading in the population was fueled not just by advances in the private sector, but also by the government provision of free public libraries. Before 1844, the speed of communication was limited to that made possible by the railroad, horse, and sailing ship. In the history of technology spanning millennia, there had never been so radical an increase in the speed of communication as that made possible by the 1844 invention of the telegraph. By 1870, there was a long line of inventors waiting to take the next step by converting the dot dash of the telegraph code to the human voice sent over a telephone. By a narrow margin, Alexander Graham Bell achieved the first patent. And for that reason, during the 20th century, the telephone network of AT&T was known as the Bell System. Telephones arrived in the American home relatively slowly over the five decades between 1876 and 1926. But it became the dominant form of communication during that interval. The innovations that created modern entertainment started with the phonograph. Before its arrival, there was no way that most families outside of the largest cities could hear professional renditions of classical or popular music. The slow development of the phonograph contrasted with the instant acceptance of radio. Unlike the phonograph, which imposed a cost to buy recordings, radio offered its multiple forms of content, from news to comedy to music, for free. Though there is supposed to be no such thing as a free lunch, Radio almost achieved that impossibility, especially in the 1930s, when radio set prices fell below $20. No longer did the most humble family need to buy records to hear music. It was all free on the radio. A contemporary reader might join me in being surprised at the early chronology of motion pictures and the rapidity of its transition to a major industry. The Nickelodeon suddenly emerged in 1906 to 7. And by 1911, the grand movie palaces were being built, with terracotta decoration and full-length silent features to attract customers. Throughout the first three decades of the 20th century, the quality of every aspect of entertainment improved, and by 1928, the era of the talking motion picture had begun. How far had we come? Starting from nothing but isolation in 1870, within 70 years, the nation was brought together. No fewer than 40 million people, fully a third of the population, listened to the 1938 radio match race between Seabiscuit and War Admiral. Millions witnessed that magical moment when Dorothy emerged from sepia into color with the iconic words, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Perhaps no greater symbol of the arrival of mass entertainment is a little-known journey taken by David O. Selznick, producer of Gone with the Wind, two months before the movie's 1939 release. The theater owner had been contacted, he had agreed, and the producer showed up in Santa Barbara 
with a big surprise for the audience. An announcement came over the public address system that they would not be seeing either of the double features scheduled for that night. The theater manager told the audience it was about to see a very special picture and that no one would be allowed to leave once it had started. Guards were posted in the lobby throughout the screening. When the main title came on the screen, there were excited gasps and cheers. Many people rose to their feet and applauded, as they did at the end, three hours and 45 minutes later without intermission. Selznick was moved to tears by the enthusiasm. The audience left the theater that night with a sense of privilege that they had chanced upon something so special that it would instantly make them famous among their friends and about which they would be able to brag to their grandchildren many years hence. None of that could have happened in 1870. Yet in 1939, everything seemed possible. Radio and the motion picture had reached the pinnacle of their achievement. But television was still to come, vividly demonstrated at the 1939-40 New York World Fair. Was the modern world of 1940 more distant from 1870 than today's entertainment in 2015 is from that of 1940? We will revisit that question in Chapter 12. Please subscribe and press the bell icon to never miss another update. Please like, share and comment.